Welcome to the Learning Can't Wait podcast, a Full Mind production. At Full Mind, our vision is to ensure every child has access to an exceptional education. Each episode, we will be joined by pathfinders within and around the education space who are bringing about transformational change on behalf of deserving students. I am your host, Kaylee Spearbauer. Welcome back, everybody, to the Learning Can't Wait podcast season four. I am very excited to introduce you to today's esteemed guest, someone that I admire and have followed their career for quite a while. It is Carl Rectanis, the Senior Vice President of Global K-12 Strategy at Instructure and co-founder and CEO of Learn Platform. Carl, welcome to the podcast. Oh, Haley, thank you. That's very kind. Uh, It's great to be here. I'm excited to chat. I am very eager to pick your brain about a variety of topics, most notably uh, around the topic of education, ed tech, and research, which I think you know something about. <laughs> uh, maybe. Um, let's see. Uh, let's find out. to be seen. We're all on the edge of our seats. Yeah. Well, Carl, why don't you start us off by telling us how you came to be the personal and professional version of yourself? Oh, what a great question. So um, my parents were educators. A lot of my family were educators um, here and overseas. Um, And so that was a family business, um, right? So I I, uh, was raised by uh, a single mother uh, in the South, raising two boys on a teacher's salary, which can give you a sense of, um, you know, my situation and uh, ended up... um, teaching. Uh, I got a secondary education, English and history degree uh, from UNC, uh, Chapel Hill. And so I taught um, uh, here and in Japan overseas. Um, uh, Grandma says we were born with itchy feet. So we traveled a lot. I've lived and worked and studied in about a dozen different countries. Um, But uh, I actually became a CFO for schools. I moved into administration. Uh, The first year charter schools were getting started uh, in North Carolina. And the reason I did that was because I felt like the back office was sort of trying, like was having an outsized impact on what we were trying to do in the classroom. And I wanted to understand, you know, how to get more money, more resources, let teachers do the things that they wanted to do. Um, and uh, learned a ton. You know, the charter school movement was at the time very nascent. Um, nobody knew who was wearing white hats and black hats, uh, how the system was, was set up. And I learned a ton because I got a chance at a very early age to engage, you know, not just with a K-8 core knowledge, you know, set of schools, I was, we were pulling from five different districts at the time. And that's how they felt like, uh, they felt like we were taking their students and their money. Um, we were working directly with the state, uh, as an independent school district. So I was engaging in the state education agencies, um, and learned a lot about what motivated and drove, uh, the system. And so since then, and after coming back to the States, after traveling, uh, and studying and working as in education, uh, I got the entrepreneurial bug and um, uh, have launched four successful education innovation organizations. There's some others in the trash. Uh, but as you mentioned earlier, uh, the most recent one was Learn Platform. Um, uh, but the through line on all of them has been uh, how to sort of approach and help the education system systematically improve outcomes for all. Uh, not just uh, for those who have access, but for underrepresented uh, uh, and and others that, you know, for me, education was a pathway out. Um, and I want that to be a pathway out for everybody. But that wasn't the way the system was set up. Um, and if we could work inside, outside and through the system to make it more effective for everybody, I think that's better, not just for those who have been underserved, but for society, for our economy, for everyone. And that's been the through line uh, to the work that I've been focused on. How interesting that your like first journey out of the classroom was in the, as you said, in the back office to see how the purse strings were really having such an impact on the classroom. You know, 
I imagine that your CFO hat that you wore at the top of your uh, out of classroom career has played a particular import as you study and look at the financial landscape, uh, federal kind of uh, funding that's going on right now in the education space today. What's your take on the influx of federal dollars, the fiscal cliff that's approaching, and even your through line of how this impacts equity for students across the country? Great question. I mean, uh, right. Uh, Method Man would tell us that uh, cash rules everything around me, right? Um, it's Method Man would tell us that. <laughs> important to understand. Uh, so it's important to consider. I think the um, the other uh, truth that I've learned over a career or come to believe is that when it comes to um, financial decisions, that includes procurement uh, and others in education, um, they're motivated right now. The system is motivated by three things, and it tends to be in this order. The first one is fear. Um, it is uh, the fear of you know, getting in the paper for the wrong thing. It is the fear of um, cyber attacks. It is fear of, uh, you know, for safety, you know, fear is a, a huge motivator. Um, uh, fear of losing one's job, you know, those are, those are big motivators. Um, that's the first. The second is regulation. Um, Right. So, uh, you know, we're required to test or we're uh, required to um, do X or Y. Title one says that this is how this should work. And so I think that's a great idea, but we have to do it this way. Um, right. So regulation is the second uh, motivator for those decisions. And the third is aspiration. Um, what's best for kids? Like, this is why we're here. This is what the things that frankly motivated me and you and others to move into education is to do what's better to help society and help teachers save time and do those other things. And not to say that that's not a huge motivator for everyday work and the focus, but when it comes to financial decisions in education, uh, what I've come to see time and time again in terms of pattern recognition from the back office to the front is fear will trump regulation, regulation will trump aspiration. But when those three things work together, um, you can get some pretty powerful systemic change. And so I think if, to go back to your question, as we think about uh, ESSER funding and a pending cliff, um, there are some very real fears that activated this, right? COVID, a closure of school, learning, um, uh, pauses on learning, things like that. Um, safety, obviously, health, well-being, um, the state of North Carolina, which is where I happen to be based, um, the school system was the largest restaurant in 2020. Uh, they delivered more uh, meals uh, than any restaurant uh, or chain combined, right? Um, you know, they are the social safety net um, for a lot of folks. That's a fear situation, right? Uh, but as we look at this cliff and the funding that's happened, um, and we think about where we are now, uh, it also opened our eyes to things like social emotional wellness. Um, it opened our eyes to, you know, what teachers are dealing with. It opened our eyes to, um, uh, to the needs that are, you know, really, if we're going to move to the next level. And I think ESSER, uh, which uh, uses the term evidence-based as an example, multiple, multiple times has said, hey, spend this money on what you need, but have evidence for how it's working and if it's working. And by the way, that's actually, you know, the law within the Every Student Succeeds Act, the, the elementary and secondary, um, you, you know, law that rules the land. That's how we're going to make these decisions. And that, that wasn't in, in writing before, uh, you, you know, and so you've got this combination of fear and regulation right, that is motivating how people are going to make these decisions there. I'm hopeful that they will make them with, you know, using evidence. Um, I'm hopeful that they will be making these decisions. And we're seeing this pattern, I think, uh, but to address very real fears of not having enough teachers, um, of not, of the teachers we do have uh, taking an undue burden uh, with their own, you, you know, physical and emotional health. 
Um, I think the opportunity to leverage this work, um, you, you know, through that fear and regulation is there. There's no doubt about those things. If we can harness that to move towards aspiration, that is having ed tech that works more effectively, having, uh, you, you know, uh, you know, supporting educators to be motivated uh, to be in education, to be able to serve more people, to be able to use these tools to leverage great teaching and learning in the right directions. I think we've got a real opportunity to improve the system. You had named there something that I don't believe everybody fully knows because not everybody understands the federal laws as well as some of the folks that are in this, this part of the sector like yourself. So you talked about how evidence was not new. Esther did, in my opinion, humble opinion, accelerate people's attention to evidence. But let's talk about that arc a little bit because you obviously were at Learn Platform. You co-founded Learn Platform. Yeah. Uh, you obviously knew that evidence was important when it related to ed tech. So let's talk about the arc of ESSA, ESSER, evidence, and really get to why you started Learn Platform and how you've seen the attention on evidence evolve over the past five years. Sure, it's really uh, two parallel stories, right? The From a regulation standpoint, and then I'll share a little bit about where Learn Platform came from and why um, you know, those stories started to uh, connect. And, and I agree with you, Haley, there's been a massive acceleration. That's not, you know, op, you know, that's not opinion. The facts are very clear on that. Um, but before the Every Student Succeeds Act, which replaced No Child Left Behind at the end of the Obama administration in 2015, it was a bipartisan supported bill uh, to uh, update to how we fund K-12 education from a federal level. Uh, programs like Title I, which is for uh, underserved communities and schools, Title II, Title IV, the federal dollars that go to states to be distributed for this work. Um, prior to that, we had No Child Left Behind, which had a pretty fo you know clear focus on assessment. But when it came to research, um, you, you know, the U.S. has not invested in education, research, and development like it does in every other sector, right? So since World War II, um, if you look at defense, transportation, healthcare, all these other sectors that are systemic and important energy, um, since World War II, on average, you've had 4 to 6% compounded improving investment for the last, you know, 70 plus years. Um, so you're now talking about sort of 12,000 percent that goes into this more goes into research and development and transportation or defense. And that's why we're a leader in the U.S. on those things. But in education, we didn't start investing in education research until 2001 uh, with the uh, creation of a different law called Ezra, but uh, Institute for Education Sciences. Um, uh, was created the Department of Ed's education arm. And fundamentally, um, you know, they're spending hundreds of millions of dollars every year. And they are uh, required to only focus, traditionally, they were required to only focus on randomized controlled trials. Um, you may have heard of the What Works Clearinghouse or uh, sometimes called RCT, oftentimes referred to as the gold standard in research. Um, well, in education, um, this it's really hard to do randomized control trials. Co-sign on that. Very, very yeah. challenging. <laughs> um, and there's also some moral and ethical questions, right? Because, you know, in a randomized control trial, some people are getting an intervention. You know, if you're in pharmaceuticals, you, you know, some people get the placebo, some people get the medicine, and then you study what happens and make those. That's a, you know, but that has to happen at random. The idea of delivering, you know, with some kids getting a good thing in a, in a math tool or uh, or a bad thing, you know, who knows? Um, that's really hard to manage. There's some ethical questions, but fundamentally, you, you know, if you look at it, it it costs too much, it takes too long, it's hard to read, and the and the situation is such that it's primarily focused on academic bench science as opposed to you know, informing development. So it's more on the R than the D. Education R&D is mostly on the R and traditionally. So fast forward to ESSA and, uh, you know, to make it, uh, you know, long story short, 
ESSA outlines four levels of evidence, which provides a regulatory framework for folks to work up to randomized control trials, which is called strong evidence. But now within ESSA, they can do things which demonstrate rationale. That's early stage you know, logic models that are based on uh, the existing science. That's how we stand on the backs of you know, smart learning science and expertise. The next stage, uh, which is called uh, promising, is uh, usually a comparative study. Uh, you know, could be correlative, but usually comparative studies. That is, when more people do it, do we see more things happening, right? And then we've got this quasi-experimental, which is called moderate uh, evidence. Um, and moderate evidence is uh, quasi-experimental, which means it's got a control group and uh, a group that receives the intervention, but it's not randomized, it's targeted. So you can you can do these more quickly at a lower cost, et cetera. And so every Student Succeeds Act says that every, all federal dollars should go to evidence-based interventions, but it counts all four of these as evidence. So you don't ever have to do an RCT. It gives you an on-ramp for any organization and intervention to start doing that. And what's happened, you know, that's part of what was happening in parallel uh, to our work. Um, I'll pause and I could share a little bit more about where Learn Platform came from, but from a policy standpoint, you know, that provided a regulatory um, carrot uh, as well as a bit of a stick to say, hey, if we're going to fund this stuff with federal dollars, let's let's figure out if it's actually helping kids learn. And even if it's at, you know, very basic levels of evidence, that still counts as evidence, right? And let's let's go do this more. I feel so relieved every time I have someone remind me that RCT has its uh, challenges from the moral, ethical. I think when I, uh, this is my own experience, but you and I have spoken before about my own passion for accountability and ev evidence-based work in education at tech specifically where I live. And I think I felt for a while until I started meeting with folks from your, from your organization and even some folks that we had on our own team that I had to get an RCT study. I had to do it. it it's the gold standard, like you said. But I feel relieved hearing that this, you know, I always feel guilty about it. Well, what if we know the intervention works? Then what are we doing to the other students who aren't receiving it? And how, how would those families feel? How would the teachers feel? It would just, it would be such an ethical quandary. Um, I think it's possible. I know it's possible. People are doing it. Yeah, we do it. But I and think that, uh, well, and if you, uh, to take it back and to, and to connect these dots that you have and others is, you, you know, when I was doing due diligence for what eventually became Learn Platform, uh, what we realized is that teachers in the classroom, I did this, you did this, are entrepreneurs. They are researchers. They are constantly trying to serve a very disparate group of customers or students, and they are actively engaging and testing things all the time, and they are learning what's working and what's not working for their kids. And the reality is that information, that evidence, that data is gone into the ether, right? Uh, because we weren't collecting it. This was in 2013, 12, 13. And what led to us launching Learn Platform in 2014 was, uh, you know, focus on we're going to help folks understand what they're using that's working best for them. Um, how do we expand, you know, access to the teaching and technology that works best for individual students? How do we activate and engage not only with educators to be able to collect that sort of observational or, you know, feedback in a meaningful way? So we had a research, you know, we were a research based uh, research first. Um, for benefit organization. So we were focused, which meant we were for profit, but we could focus on um, more than just profit when we drove uh, the business. It's a governance model that makes a lot of sense in the education space and elsewhere. But our researchers identified the eight most important criteria for teachers when they try by and use these tools. And so first we started collecting that uh, type of information. Then we started, uh, then we built something called Impact, which is our rapid cycle evaluation engine. Um, it is uh, essentially takes uh, and connects all this data from, uh, uh, you know, trusted spaces, uh, usage data, um, demographic information, 
um, achievement data, test scores, um, cost, uh, you know, pricing data. And we built some technology before it was called machine learning or AI uh, to be able to run, you know, specifically more and more rigorous analyses uh, without having a PhD to equip teachers and educators to sort of say, hey, run at that, you know, what is now called, you know, a level three or a level four or a level two. It would decide what it was going to run with the data it had and provide visualization so that administrators could say, hey, with this uh, math tool, we're getting this type of usage. And when students that, you know, are in this groups, right, that are um, third grade English language learners or, you know, in these different groups, this is what happens. This is what their growth looks like. Uh, this is what was generally called effect size uh, we're seeing. And so being able to do that in a matter of hours, minutes, instead of months and years, started to equip districts to make decisions within, you know, for, for these kids, not for kids that might look like these kids in the future or elsewhere, but for their students. And it started to change decision-making with districts and states at the same time. So you had this parallel run from 2014 up to the COVID era where you, you know, you started to see both regulation and the reality on the ground, you, you know, it can, it can be done. Um, and so there was belief in the system. And fast forward to today, you know, our team has equipped both districts, states, and uh, we can talk a little bit about our evidence as a service work with providers. But uh, before, I would say, I think by May of last, of this year, uh, districts and states had run four times as many analyses than they did all of last year using our platform. Um, we're on pace for to do 10x the amount of evidence um, and put that into, you, you know, the market so that, you know, whether you're a provider or a district administrator or a policymaker, you can have evidence and start to have this information at, at the speed of decision making, not at the speed of the ivory tower. I appreciate the depth at which you just shared the journey to the rapid proliferation of data creation and consumption that Learn Platform has afforded various stakeholders. I'm so like honestly inspired by that. And I also believe that because there has been this emphasis that we alluded to earlier of ESSER on evidence and just national attention, the media has also really played a part here as well. I, the, the recent stories over the past couple months of, if you're calling them providers, that's a word I don't use very often, vendors, ed tech companies, et cetera, because of the necessity of knowing if dollars are impactful and school savviness to that, there's been a real change in time in how the media is studying, writing about various companies. And I find that, I find that like heartening. It's like everybody's kind of on the same page with, we have to make sure what we're doing is working for children. There's a ton of money here. Yeah. Yeah. I think that, you know, <clears throat> it's a great point. And the reality is even in the words that you Mention, you know, providers, vendors, companies, for profit providers, companies, right? This education has been a low trust market for a long time. Um, you, you know, us and them, nonprofit, for profit, there's these, um, what I would consider false dichotomies based on tax status, right? Not business model, not impact, not evidence. Um, based on tax status, oh, you're a for profit, oh, you're a company, oh, you're a nonprofit, you must be, you know, nonprofit good, you know, school's good, vendor's bad, like there's this easy pathway. But the reality is like, I've bought tens of millions of dollars of, of technology and interventions as a school leader. Um, I've sold, you know, way more than that um, as a provider. Um, it's hard for everybody. And I don't engage with folks 
look, in every market, you're going to have bad actors. There, there will be people that have, lack integrity, um, folks who, you know, want to rob the bank. Um, they're, you know, let's go to, you know, energy, you know, Enron, transportation. I mean, like you can, you can do all sorts of things um, in every sector. But the reality is most of the folks that we engage with, including on the private, uh, you know, provider side, they want to do what's best for kids. They want to drive what's uh, what helps teachers. They, you know, they want to do and help society and they want to win because they are. But traditionally, you know, imagine, uh, you know, a product leader or a sales leader, you know, they can't get a return phone call on why we didn't move forward with the pilot. Or, you know, has no visibility to if they're actually implementing the tools that we want uh, or, you know, doesn't know what's going on on the other side of the fence. And so I think, you know, it's hard for both sides. And there's certainly been over promise. There's been, you know, the system is reinforced traditionally, you know, marketing over meaning and impact. The You know, nobody got fired for hiring IBM or the largest publishers uh, traditionally because, again, fear-based decision-making. Um, but now uh, people are starting to see and engage together as partners on, you know, how do we how do we get better outcomes? And that's one of the things that we did was really work hard at Learn Platform to ensure that we remained agnostic, that we um, helped the demand side become more demanding. And we waited. We didn't launch any of our services for providers until districts and states said, yes, please help providers make better products. And that happened in uh, after COVID. They said, look, we really we're overwhelmed. We're using uh, now last year, you know, every school district used over twenty five hundred different ed tech products last year. Like, that's insane. They keep, you can't. Wild. And, and for the record, I just pulled up your report because I was trying to remember the exact number. I knew you'd know it, but yeah, that's also like a two hundred in a two a two hundred tool increase from two years prior. Yes, right? like it already tipped over the two k mark, which I learned because you all put out these reports that tell us how many product schools are using. That is, I mean, I can't remember the password to my email address. Let I mean, thank gosh, there's single sign on in schools these days, but still, I can't even remember. This well, and ironically, 2,500, you know, ironically, and we remember post COVID all parents like getting overwhelmed by how do we get this signed on? How do we set this up? You know, on average, most school districts are using more than one single sign on provider. Oh, oh, I'm well aware because I have to make sure that my organization has access to them these days. But, I'm, I can't find my own kids. Baby. I'm signing yeah. into three different apps. I'm, I, it's just unbelievable. Uh, you know, the, the number, the number of tools component, I think is a, is a really interesting study in supply and demand. I also think that in two years, so it's August, we're recording this in August, 2023. I think yep. in two years, I'm going to be very curious what that number is and specifically segmented by individual market. When this tranche of money is, is less uh, relevant. I'm curious if it will change. I don't have a, I have clearly somewhat of a prediction, but based on my tone, but I am, I am really curious to see what that number looks like when learn, more, learn platform and instructor publishes that report in a couple of years. Well, I'll tell you what gives me hope around this. Cause the other number that we shared is, um, and I, actually why, uh, why I probably think it's going to be higher than you think it's going to be. Okay. It tell is, me. uh, because, the number of tools that each individual student or teacher engaged with went down. Mm. Uh, so now what that means is what's happening. And what I think I've, we're seeing is sort of the platformization of this work. So you're starting to see, you know, from that's what they we would say from the education, from the technology side. But, you know, what gives me hope is that that means students and teachers might be activating more agency mm -hmm. on which of these tools they're engaging with. They're not engaging with all of them. The numbers actually went down for those individuals, but at an organizational level, we're requiring our districts to manage all of these so that they can use these personalized tools 
you know, for their third grade English language learners, as well as a different tool for their third grade high achieving math students or, you know, supplementary tools or for different uh, parts of the, uh, you know, learning process. So I think what we're going to see, and certainly the initial trend looks like, uh, to me, like an increased um, burden or responsibility on organizations to provide a high functioning ecosystem that is safe, that is, um, uh, you, you know, takes care of student data privacy, that is efficient, um, but that also is diverse, is is able to deliver against this, you know, what is becoming you know, a much more diverse student population that every public school system is is trying to support. I love hope like that. And I'm so and I'm so grateful you're naming this piece about personalization because I think that's what ed tech allows for. Mm. And I think making teachers' lives easier is ultimately where we should all be so that teachers can focus on their craft and focus on the individual students in front of them. And so I love that that is where we're unfortunately wrapping up our time today. That is an incredibly, incredibly great note to kind of land on before I ask you my last question. Sure. And that question is, is about teachers. And it is, what advice, Carl, would you give a teacher who's beginning their career today? Well, first off, thank you. Um, teachers, for your service, for your commitment. Uh, you know, learning ultimately, you know, the human learning science is um, most motivated by relationship. Um, I mean, the science shows that. And so without educators, you, you know, even as we think about AI, as we think about, you know, new technologies, um, there's nothing more impactful than an educator. If you are starting right now, the um, this is a this is a marathon, not a sprint. Um, so take care of yourself. My advice is to engage in a way that you can ensure self care um, and um, and ask for help uh, to be able to do that. Um, and I I appreciate the service. It's a very personal sort of question and uh, commentary uh, for me, uh, but. We are in a place where we need more educators, um, and uh, I can't end without uh, saying very clearly, uh, we need to take care of educators financially. We need to take care of educators in a way that respects and supports them to grow, um, and uh, emotionally and mentally. Um, so anything we can do to advocate, to support policymakers and others, uh, to make sure that the education profession is held in the esteem that it should be and likely hasn't been in many states, uh, we will do. But um, make sure you're taking care of yourself and uh, asking for help where you need it. Carl, that is such a beautiful message and such strong acknowledgement of the incredible work that our teachers do and the sacrifices they make to be their very best. And I appreciate how you've touched upon that here. And also, I'm so grateful you came on the podcast. That and was that fun. We were connected by a whole bunch of people who said, hey, Lee, you have to meet Carl. And now I have. And now here you are. Thank you so uh, much for taking your time to, to join the Learning Can't Wait podcast. Hey, thanks for everything. Uh, I really enjoy the conversation, but I enjoy listening and uh, I enjoy the work that you guys do. So thanks so much. Thank you. And I'll be continuing to follow the incredible work of Learn Platform and the Instructor family. And I hope that you all enjoyed today's episode with Carl Rectanis. Thanks. Thanks for listening to the Learning Can't Wait podcast. If you like what you heard, please rate, review, and share this episode. Be the first to know when we have a new episode by subscribing wherever you listen to podcasts. If you'd like to be a guest on the show or have a suggestion for an episode, email us at podcast at fullmindlearning.com.